Uh, yeah, no, I'm not releasing a three hour long video. This has already taken me way too long to edit. I've put absolutely everything into this video. I've started doing data greetings. I've contacted mod creators. I've done literally everything I can to make the quality of this video as good as it is. And it's only birth by sleep. It's an hour and 40 minutes. And I know I said, hey, I'm going to add dream drop distance as well and make it three hours. But it's just taken way too long. I've Everybody's been waiting for so long and I've already said like back in April that I'll like, yeah, I'm back and working on the video. <laughs> it's been so long, guys. It's taking so long. So I'm just going to release Birth by Sleep. I'm sorry. I've lied to you too many times. Uh, get over it. It's a YouTube video. <laughs> but with all of that said, without further ado, welcome to part three, everybody. Okay, all joking aside, we're going to continue our journey rewriting Kingdom Hearts. We've changed a lot of things about the overall series, as well as reworked Kingdom Hearts 1, Chain of Memories, 358 Days, and Cage 2, and uh, Coded. It goes without saying that the changes I make in this video will make zero sense unless you've seen the previous installments. Yeah, they're long as shit. Unfortunately, that's the nature of this project. However, I put quick recaps at the start of these videos, so there's always that if you just want to watch me talk about your favorite video games. I want to say that everyone's creative suggestions and feedback help me out immensely when writing this portion of the story, so please, like I ask every video, if you have any suggestions for things I've missed or changes you think would work better, feel free to leave them in the comments. I want to give a huge, huge shout out to my buddy Ivan, who went out of his way to make a couple of custom mods just for this video. If you're into Kingdom Hearts 3 modding, I highly recommend you check out his channel, as he has a lot of really cool character and map mods that most of which he makes himself. And of course, because I started using data greetings to make this video, there is a huge laundry list of mods, all of which I'm going to leave in the description so that you can download and check out yourself. Last but not least, this is a spoiler warning for the entire story, including the ending of Union Cross, so be warned. Without further ado, here's a recap of the previous video. If you don't want to hear it, you can skip to this timestamp. Xemnas is an unnatural heart of pure light who wishes to obtain the Kingdom Keys and control Kingdom Hearts in order to extinguish all darkness. Xehanort's plan was to have Ansem and Xemnas be able to summon the Kingdom Keys, and while Ansem was successful, Xemnas was not. So Xemnas formed the organization to try and find the Kingdom Key. The organization is no longer about Xehanort dividing his heart into 13 of darkness or about collecting hearts to create an artificial Kingdom Hearts, but rather it simply consists of fragmented hearts brutally experimented on by Xemnas and forced to do his bidding, stripped of their memories and are tasked with locating Sora, except Zigbar and Saiyak aren't actually fragments and are Xehanort's personal disciples pretending to be fragments. The organization acts more like a mafia, picking fights with Disney and Final Fantasy characters trying to track down Sora, essentially actually being villains. In days, Roxas and Shion are recruited because Xemnas believes they'll be able to summon the Kingdom Key, even though they can't at first. As Roxas and Shion start to develop their own personalities, they also fall in love and start dating, making it that much more heartbreaking that they're pitted against each other by Gnosis, who still believes they have to return to Sora. Riku and Namine spy on the organization and train to use their dark powers, also catching feelings for one another. Shion doesn't get forgotten after she's defeated, Riku doesn't turn into Ansem but rather uses his dark mode and wins the fight, in Cage 2, Kairu remembers Sora normally and goes on her own journey after linking with Roxas, summoning her Keyblade earlier. Riku and Namine set out to protect Sora and Kairu from the shadows, Sora doesn't forget the events of Castle Oblivion, Anti-Sora is woven into the plot, Kairi learns the Sage King of Hollow Bastion, Gnosis is her grandfather but assumes he's dead, Kairi then doesn't get kidnapped by Axel but rather escapes with the help of Namine, Mickey learns that Gnosis his apprentice, who's actually Xehanort but went by the name Ansem, planned to split his heart between light and dark, discovering Xemnas' true nature as a heart of pure light. Everyone questions their understanding, knowing the organization serves the light but is still evil and wants to hurt people. Axel freaks out on Gnosis for what he did to Roxas and Shion, which allows Xemnas to capture Gnosis. Namine no longer returns to Kairi at all and makes it out okay in the end. Gnosis and Kairi finally meet and share a reunion, paying off Kairi's arc to discover her past. Then Gnosis sacrifices himself by blasting Xemnas with a machine that wounds his heart in a similar way to how Ansem's spell messed up Sora's heart in Cage 1. The ending is much more sad to reflect the grief everyone now feels. The extended scene from Coded where Mickey writes to Sora is just added to the end of Cage 2, and Coded is completely retconned having never existed, because that game was pointless. <sighs> Jesus. Again, if you want to understand why I made those changes, you'll have to watch the previous videos because I explain my changes as I go. Before we continue, I want to backtrack and tackle things I've missed. Yes, I fuck up sometimes when making these videos. There have been some oversights and some details I've mixed up that I want to address now before we continue. And these were pointed out by you guys in the comments, so thank you. First off, I've continually referred to Xehanort as an anti-hero. The term I'm actually looking for is anti-villain. Didn't know that was a term at the time. 
My bad. If you need proof that I'm not a professional writer, there you go. Xehanort is an anti-villain, with perspectives and ideas that are agreeable, but methods and solutions that are more disagreeable. Heartless were never beings without hearts. It's a bit of a misnomer. In the original, when a person dies, heartless are the darkness of that person's heart left over, but still technically contain hearts for some reason. And then their bodies become nobodies, which do technically lack hearts and are like hollow shells. None of it's relevant anymore because I changed the nature of these two classes, but I want to address that I messed up the details. I, uh, I haven't watched the cutscenes for KH1 since I was a kid. When talking about the name change of Ansem the Wise to Gnosis, I briefly glazed over Ansem's reports, newly dubbing them as Gnosis's reports. However, in the original, most of Ansem's reports were actually written by Terra Xehanort when he was operating under Ansem's name. Since the name confusion no longer applies, this needs to be addressed properly, which I failed to do. A lot of what Ansem wrote about in the original doesn't work anymore because of how many things I've changed, so here's what should happen to the report reports in cage 1 and cage 2. Firstly, in cage 1, they should simply be renamed to the secret reports, with you having no idea who wrote them. Maybe you first get the impression that they're Ansem's reports, but you don't learn until cage 2 that they were actually Xehanort's reports. In cage 2, however, they should be called Gnosis's reports, as Gnosis originally wrote all of these. The contents of these reports can be in the same spirit as the original, wherein they express the nature of hearts, keyblades, kingdom hearts, etc., but are simply tweaked to the new story changes, whereby they describe the heartless, the properties of the hearts, the nature of darkness and light, the nobodies, the research of Gnosis's team, and can even discuss ideas we haven't been formally introduced to, such as the fabled Keyblade War, or bits and nods to Xehanort's former plan in Birth by Sleep, while leaving plenty of other things perfectly vague. And now... Let's move on. I want to preface that the story of Kingdom Hearts from here on out is going to diverge from the original much more significantly than previous installments. Earlier games benefited from ignorance, meaning the overarching conflict wasn't at the forefront, we hadn't even met the main antagonist, and our characters had no idea what exactly was going on. They were simply thrust into conflicts they didn't understand. So while the stories definitely were important to establishing the nature of the series, there were a lot of story elements that were somewhat inconsequential, meaning the earlier games didn't have to change as much in order to get us to this point. This is simply no longer the case, as with Birth by Sleep, we're thrust right into the true motivations of the mastermind behind the overarching conflict, and you, the player, will finally learn the truth. Much of the progression of these games will remain intact, but major story elements may be unrecognizable, and certain characters will play very different roles. I'm confident that this is all for the better, as these games receive most of the criticism, but do know that this is no longer just an enhanced reboot, but a heavy reimagining. Kind of tossing the whole final draft spiel out of the window? Fuck it. I'm already this far. With that being said, let's kick it off with Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep. Oh. There's a lot of mysterious themes and narrative elements I've been hinting at that have gone unexplained up to this point. So with Birth by Sleep, it's time to put the overarching conflict in the spotlight and really hone in on the nuance behind the duality of light and dark. The original story, while definitely hinted at light and dark being in balance, especially with lines in Cage 2 and Birth by Sleep, But the world's made of light and darkness. You can't have one without the other. Cause darkness is half of everything. Light and darkness, they are a balance. One that must always be maintained. It never left much room to explore that idea because darkness had to be the enemy. And with my big change to how the forces of light are at fault when it comes to why the universe is imbalanced, I want to set this story up in a much more grandiose way. Because I'm not tackling Kingdom Hearts Union Cross, there's also a bit of lore dump involved in setting up the story this way and, naturally, a lot of retconning. As I explained in part one, long ago, someone gained access to the Key of Hearts and released too much light from Kingdom Kingdom Hearts, eating away at the darkness as a result. Due to the imbalance of Kingdom Hearts, the Key of Hearts split into the two Kingdom Keys, and as imbalance spread across the universe, there were many people who wished to restore said balance, while others cling to the supremacy of light and only wish to suppress the darkness further. This culminated in what is known as the Keyblade War, where these two opposing sides, balance versus imbalance, clashed in an epic conflict using weapons called Keyblades, and each side was led by a chosen wielder of the Kingdom Keys. In the end, those who fought for the supremacy of light secured the final victory, the kingdom keys were lost, and darkness would continue to be purged from the lands for years to come, forcing them into their own realm, thus dividing the realms of light and darkness. In a last-ditch effort, the forces of darkness were able to seize the entirety of Kingdom Hearts and take it to the realm of darkness, where it still resides to this day. Over a long period of time, despite losing Kingdom Hearts, the forces of light continued to manually purge darkness from the worlds in all corners of the universe, and much of the history surrounding the present state of things 
Rose has been revised to fit the Light's agenda. This situation leads into where we find ourselves today. Our characters, Ericus, Xehanort, Terra, Ventus, and Aqua, are the descendants of those agents of light whose mission is to purge the darkness. I want to set Birth by Sleep up by expanding on the Keyblade wielders and the people they're comprised of. Here's a big change. These so-called Keyblade wielders belong to a lineage of mercenaries based out of the Land of Departure, and are loyal agents of light whose purpose is to oppress the darkness. Trained and indoctrinated at birth, certain children are raised to fight against the darkness and become soldiers, and those who prove they have the strongest of hearts, being those who work the best as a team, save lives and become admired, build the strongest friendships, etc., are chosen by the mysterious magical forces of the universe to wield Keyblades. They get sent out on missions to kill any Heartless that appear across the worlds, and they also go on missions to clear out Dark Corridors, those bridges to the Dark Realm I've mentioned previously, by pushing the darkness back as far as possible to prevent them from escaping into the Realm of Light. After proving their prowess by demonstrating great heroism or surmounting a grand mission, Elders of the Keyblade can appoint the Mark of Mastery, making them Keyblade Masters, the best of the best. Over time, as darkness subsided more and more, there were fewer and fewer Soldiers of Light chosen to be Keyblade Keyblade wielders, as their intentions to bring in balance are increasingly at odds with being deemed worthy. So there are very few Keyblade wielders left from the Land of Departure. But in order to accurately portray this expanded narrative and backstory, and set the future of Kingdom Hearts up in an interesting way, I'll need to expand the roster of characters a bit. The best way to go about it, I think, is to borrow characters from Union Cross, and introduce them here instead. Presiding alongside Masters Ericus and Xehanort should be the Keyblade wielders from Union Cross Dark Road. Braggy, Hermode, Urd, and Vor. Now in old age, these are also Elder Keyblade Masters who command the Soldiers of Light, and together with Xehanort and Ericus act as a council to conspire against the darkness. These four characters will play a sort of background role in this game, and there aren't really opportunities in this story to get to know them much, but they'll be used for expositional purposes, and they'll mostly be used to play off of Master Ericus. However, they'll be much more important in future installments. And also, there's another character I want to introduce here that will be used to explain parts of our characters' past, and that's Ephemer. Ephemer will be someone who was a fellow Keyblade wielder and previous close comrade of our main trio, Terra, Ventus, and Aqua, but is no longer around for reasons I'll explain later. I'll mention that to have too many Keyblade warriors running around in present day, especially ones loyal to light, would overcomplicate things, so it's why I only opted to shoehorn a handful of them into my rewrite. However, I think throughout the Land of Departure there should be an army of generic soldiers of light, ones who wield regular weapons, never worthy of wielding Keyblades, but still warriors subservient to the Keyblade Masters. This is mostly to accommodate the now expanded world and lore, as well as add a sense of life to the areas. After all, an entire world with such a massive history History only populated by these nine characters makes very little sense, and was one of the biggest problems with the original setup. There doesn't even have to be much to these random soldiers, they can have generic designs and wield swords, shields, and staffs. Another detail about the Keyblade Masters is they should command the Nobodies. The Nobodies are like a reserve army of light creatures that the Land of Departure has used for centuries, and the Keyblade Masters can call upon them instantly in a time of need. For now, this is where we find Terra, Ventus, and Aqua, soldiers who are trained under Master Ericus, who all go around fighting the darkness while Ericus's lifelong friend, Master Xehanort, wiggles his fingers, plotting to dismantle the conspiracy from within to further his secret agenda of obtaining the Key of Hearts. What changes of Terra, Ven, and Aqua as characters? These guys weren't that bad in retrospect, but they felt kinda dull. They were clearly written to have strong parallels to Sora, Riku, and Kairi, but in ways that were kinda hollow and cheap-feeling. It doesn't do it justice that their interactions feel very forced and have almost none of the charm of the Paupu trio. I think there's a better opportunity to explore different kinds of characters with different types of friendships. They don't have to be super derivative of our original trio because in the end they aren't our original trio, and we're already being forced to play as these new characters in order to experience the story, so it's better if they're interesting in their own right and be connected for different reasons. Reasons. I felt like the Wayfinder trio were underwhelming, appearing super badass in the KH2 secret ending, but ended up not really proving that they were any better than the characters we've seen before, like Sora and Riku, not to mention how absolutely god-tier Lingering Will seemed. So here's my first big change to the Wayfinders. All three of them should already be Keyblade Masters. I don't want them to be written as anywhere close to novices because I want them to contrast with characters from the previous games. In other words, I want them to be seasoned badasses in order to set a bar that our other protagonists should strive to become in the future. My second big change to the Wayfinders is to the reason they're friends in the first place. 
shared struggle. Struggle! The strength of their friendship was born out of the conflicts they've been involved in, how they had to literally trust each other with their lives, how they've all experienced the same horrors and pain, having lost mutual comrades in battle, and how they would protect each other at all costs. They're friends because only they've experienced the horrible things they have. In that sense, it's nothing we haven't seen before in storytelling, but it's a different form of friendship than we've seen previously, and it fits with the darker tone. Ultimately, I think it's more interesting than just, Hi, we are friends because we are friends. However, the unique challenge I'm faced with in portraying this friendship as believable is the fact that a lot of it you don't really get to see, because most of their crucial history is in the past, and can only be told through flashbacks, given the way this story is structured. I think the original did a very poor job with their flashbacks, in that they didn't really show anything. Aw, oh, sick, dude. Look at Tara and Ven swinging their swords at literally nothing and smiling at each other. But at the same time, stopping and displaying good in-depth flashbacks could hurt the pacing of the game. I don't know. I'm only going to touch upon a few key flashbacks anyways that I think best fit the projected character development. If we were experiencing this rewrite as a full game, it might hurt the pacing, but I think it's worth it. In terms of specific character changes, let's first talk about Terra. Hear me out on this one. I want Terra to be a sort of war hero, respected across the world, considered one of the best Keyblade Masters, even expected to surpass his own Master Ericus. My reasoning for this is not because I hate the idea of Aqua being stronger than him, in fact, that was an awesome component of her character role in the original. Rather, I want this position to make Terra's struggle with the darkness that much more of a shock to the people around him, and also make those close to him more hesitant to immediately cast him out, despite their life indoctrination towards the light. Everyone knows Terra is a stellar guy, especially those close to him, so Terra suddenly gaining the ability to control the darkness pits everyone close to him in another one of those moral quandaries I've talked about before, no longer sure if darkness automatically makes someone bad. Essentially, Terra's disposition is to sell the flip side of darkness not being evil. In the original game, Terra's complete willingness to be manipulated by anything and everything obviously evil, be it Xehanort or the Disney villains, made sense for what they were going for, but would only make him look dumb here. So Terra should easily recognize obvious evil doings while still questioning himself due to Xehanort's manipulation. Ultimately, I don't think Terra's arc should be him learning to play the bad guy, so he no longer does the Disney villains' evil biddings. That definitely makes a lot of the original original Disney subplots obsolete, but I don't really want to focus on those, so whatever. Aqua, on the other hand, was always in a tough spot because her character never had anything directly to do with Xehanort's schemes. Rather, she simply cares deeply about her friends. She's definitely my favorite out of the original characters, so I'm being biased when I say that I'm not going to change much about Aqua. She's already a badass. Her being tasked by Ericus to keep close tabs on Terra's darkness can stay mostly the same, but we'll take it in some more creative directions. And also, her coming to terms with the darkness due to her trust in Terra will play a role in her character arc here, and will lead into Zero Point Two, where we'll revisit her story. Now let's discuss Ventus. He's a difficult one to say the least. His origins going back to the Union Cross days doesn't really work anymore because there will be no time travel. And also, I don't have intentions to develop the significance of the pods in Hollow Bastion. So in the effort of not having to leave his origins completely unexplained by keeping things the same, I'm changing it so that Ven is just a normal guy from the present. Maybe a little less fantastical, but you'll see why in a minute. Yes, I made Ven a Keyblade Master despite the fact that he's still younger than both Terra and Aqua, but I want to think of it like he's a sort of young prodigy, way ahead of his class. Through the experience of being thrust into life or death combat, he had to grow up quickly, and Aqua and Terra had to put their judgments about his age aside, showing that friendship can transcend age gaps if it's through shared struggle. I do, however, think it makes sense that Ventus be the most idealistic of the bunch and be the one most hesitant to accept Terra's affinity for the darkness. I think it's a good trait to add friction between these characters characters to really portray how difficult a decision it is given how loyal they are to the light. But that's not even the toughest part about rewriting Ven. The most difficult part is in regards to his freaking heart. His dynamic with Venetus, how Venetus is the darkness of Ven's heart, is something I'm completely getting rid of. Let me explain myself. I have a very different idea of who I want Venetus to be and what he represents. And in order to pull it off, Ventus and Venetus can't be related at all. Well, then who is he and why should anyone care about him? I want Venetus 
Zeus to be an agent of darkness, a Keyblade wielder from the Realm of Darkness who Master Xehanort met during one of his many secret ventures. Vanitas should be a sort of representative of the darkness, almost like a trusted spokesperson who embodies the struggles the darkness go through and the resentment towards the agents of light. He works with Xehanort because he believes Xehanort can be their man on the inside, also knowing that the forces of darkness are fond of Xehanort. My reasoning for the changes to Vanitas is because we needed some sort of voice for the darkness, a character who helps the player understand exactly what the forces of darkness want and why they do the things they do. In the grand scheme of things, Vanitas should be a good guy, or an anti-hero jaded by the hardships of being oppressed his entire life, and is still pretty stoic and kind of a harsh asshole, but whose intentions and actions are to set things right in the best way possible. I also want Vanitas to act as a moral alternative to Xehanort, who, again, may technically be correct in his quest for balance, but Vanitas recognizes that Xehanort is more opportunistic and self-interested than is necessary, so he is skeptical and hesitant to fully trust him. Overall, I want Vanitas to be the moral center of the entire series going forward. I know, kind of a lot. Vanitas should still be introduced as an antagonist because he obviously opposes the Agents of Light, but as the protagonists start to come around, Vanitas will start to look less and less evil to our heroes and to the player. Which leads me into the complicated triangle of Ventus, Vanitas, and Sora. This is the part of the KH rewrite that has me bashing my face against the keyboard, figuring out if it still makes sense to have Vanitas look like Sora because that's definitely one of the most iconic reveals in the entire series. So with what will probably be my biggest ass pull of the entire rewrite, Vanitas still looks like Sora. Not because of any real ties to Sora and Ven's hearts, but because in the Realm of Darkness, Vanitas' face is usually formless, simply donning the black helmet. But when he was first brought to the Realm of Light by Xehanort, he arrived at Destiny Islands, where he coincidentally spots a young Sora playing from afar and uses his dark powers to shapeshift his face to look like Sora's so that he can blend in better even though Vanitas' face won't be revealed until the end anyways. What's the point of him wearing the helmet at all then? Well the same reason all of our characters wear armor. Protection. I don't freaking know man. The reveal of Vanitas looking like Sora is too dope to get rid of even though it's still one of those silly Nomura-isms. I make these exceptions for you guys. If you don't like it just imagine he always wears his helmet because it changes almost nothing. Before we talk about Xehanort, I want to quickly mention Xehanort's theme song. It's a very ominous, evil song that I recognize is very fitting with what Nomura was going for, but with Xehanort now being less an accumulation of evil and more of a nuanced character, I think a different theme song is in order. One soundtrack I think fits Xehanort strangely well is the Scala Ad Kylum theme from KH3. There's a sense of mystery and sorrow to this music that, if branded to Xehanort as a character, really emphasizes a hero that has degenerated over time who you never quite understand until the very end, which is similar to how Scala Ad Kylum changes over time and is also shrouded in mystery, so the way the song was composed translates over nicely in my opinion. So I'm making this Xehanort's theme song instead. Don't worry too much about Scala Ad Kylum, it's not going anywhere. I have another soundtrack in mind for the world when the time comes. So what is Xehanort's agenda in this game? Xehanort still wishes to coerce Terra into submitting to darkness, but he also wishes to help Vanitas lead the darkness to the Realm of Light and initiate a new Keyblade War, hoping that in doing so it will prove the strength of Vanitas' will and allow him to summon one of the Kingdom Keys. Kind of complicated sounding, I know. With the parameters I've designed, that's the best I could come up with. <laughs> Ultimately, my idea is that the only way to bring the Kingdom Keys back into existence is to initiate another Keyblade War, by which opposing forces consisting of Keyblade wielders clash in the fight for Kingdom Hearts. In the Realm of Darkness, Vanitas shows Xehanort ancient hieroglyphs left by Ancestors of Darkness that appear to describe how the Kingdom Keys can be summoned again one day by initiating another Keyblade War. The Keyblade War would be declared when each collective force proves the strength of their resolve, and two opposing figures with the strongest of wills emerge to lead the fight for their side, both of which would inevitably wield the Kingdom Keys. Vanitas and Xehanort hypothesize that if Vanitas can prove to the universe that the darkness has the ability to take bold action and successfully 
eventually lead the forces of darkness into the realm of light, one of the kingdom keys would appear before him, with the other kingdom key appearing before the one who opposes him the most. Xehanort first suggests to pit Venetus against Terra, but seeing as Terra instead reacted to darkness, Xehanort and Venetus instead shift their focus to Aqua, until finally landing on Ventus, for reasons I'll explain once I get there. Now there's kind of a big problem here. How is Xehanort supposed to be evil if he's technically doing the right thing? I want to demonstrate where Xehanort goes wrong when he becomes too apathetic towards using the Heartless as pawns, by having zero disregard for even those closest to him, and by wanting to steal the glory all for himself. Venetus feels Xehanort is too comfortable with manipulating the darkness to their own demise, just so Xehanort doesn't have to get his hands dirty. Now it's important to discuss the role of Yen Sid in King Mickey in this story. Yen Sid's importance cannot be understated because he's supposed to be everyone's mentor later on, but is also also a retired Keyblade Master, so with this new expanded setup surrounding Keyblade Masters, what exactly are Master Yen Sid's thoughts on light and darkness, and what are his relations with the Land of Departure? Largely, his perspective should change as everyone else's changes, or more specifically as King Mickey's changes. Yen Sid should still have been raised alongside Xehanort and Ericus, and had been a Keyblade Master operating out of the Land of Departure, but developed different passions and formulated his own goals, thus retiring. Yen Sid's role shouldn't be about keeping an eye on the balance of light and darkness like it is originally because given his background that no longer makes sense. I think instead, Yen Sid's personal objective should be researching and understanding the different worlds with the ultimate goal of learning how to bring all these worlds back together again. Yen Sid should have been one of the earliest individuals to recognize how all of these separate worlds appear to have been connected at one point in time, as one giant super world, due to the way these worlds are structured and the planetary paths they're set on as they all seemingly drift further away from each other. Over time, Yen Sid distanced himself from the land of departure, as their obsession with war and conquest no longer interested Yen Sid, but he still occasionally communicates with them if he comes across relevant information. This research is also what drew King Mickey under Yen Sid's apprenticeship. The king also became curious of other worlds, as he was able to travel outside his own world through the use of the gummy ship, and Mickey started to notice much of the same phenomenon, worlds drifting apart. So as we encounter Mickey throughout Birth by Sleep, he's pretty much just going around researching the worlds. This becomes becomes the primary objective of what Yen Sid and King Mickey set out to understand later in the series. What exactly is Kingdom Hearts and how is it connected to the Drifting Worlds? With all of that, it's time to start journeying through the story. A lot of it has to do with setting up the beginning in a completely different way, so bear with me. The opening scene can still take place on Destiny Islands, but it'll be a very different circumstance. With Ventus no longer being a fractured heart from the past, Xehanort doesn't bring him to the island at all, and Ventus doesn't yet connect his heart with Sora's. We'll save that for later. Ven's not present in this scene. Instead, the scene should still begin at night on the main island where we catch a young Sora and Riku playing on the shore. From across the way, we see a dark portal, and out comes Xehanort and Venetus. Venetus is seeing the Realm of Light with his own eyes for the first time, and comments how it's much calmer and more beautiful than the Realm of Darkness, but remarks how that tranquility is built on the blood of countless Heartless. Xehanort points out how Venetus will have a hard time blending in, seeing as how he doesn't have a face. Venetus replies, I know that, and looks over to Sora, still playing on the shore from afar. Cut to the camera showing Venetus below head level where you hear his face transforming. Xehanort smirks in approval over his new appearance, which you obviously don't get to see yet. Venetus puts his helmet back on, and Xehanort continues how their first plan of action should be to draw out Terra, whom Xehanort first believes is the best candidate for clashing with Venetus. Venetus asks how to draw him out, to which Xehanort Xehanort replies, there's no cry for help Terra won't respond to. So I want to set up the introduction of our protagonists in a completely new way. A way that is meant to portray that these characters are all badasses, the likes of which we haven't seen before, displaying how they operate seamlessly as a team, as well as set up the instance where Terra accidentally unlocks the darkness. I know what you're thinking, what could possibly be cooler than smacking around a swing and a couple of balls? Xehanort sends a bunch of Heartless to a world so that the Wayfinders will be called in to immediate response. So our heroes introduction begins as they're flying across space on their Keyblade gliders after being called to action to fend off the Heartless in the Enchanted Dominion. I don't know, the world could have been anywhere, I just like the setting. The area is swarmed with Unversed, which are the exact same as the Heartless, they're just new types of Heartless for variety's sake, so I'll be calling them Heartless for the remainder of the series. The sequence will have you playing as all three of these characters, Terra, Ven, and Aqua, who are donning full armor at different sections and using each character's strengths and advantages 
to teach the player how to use the different mechanics. You'll get a decent feel for each character in this period, while the characters you're not currently using are simply party members. You'll also get a sense of this trio's synergy and teamwork as they use Terra's brawn, Ventus's agility, and Aqua's witchcraft, making swift callouts and protecting each other's flank. This will all culminate in a boss battle, where you choose which character you want to play as before you fight, and whichever one you choose, you continue playing as for the rest of their story. And once that character's story is completed, you'll be given the option to choose another character, similar to how it is originally, and skip this whole introduction for your convenience. Once you beat the boss in battle, the cutscene afterwards has the trio still in the midst of battle, and the boss hits them with a mega destruction dark ball of darkness and destruction, knocking Ven and Aqua back. However, Taro's body reacts to it, and instead it flows through him, leaving him strangely unscathed. Terra's briefly confused, but thinks little of it as the boss rushes in to attack Aqua and Ven while they're down. Terra quickly goes in to protect them, and as he attempts to strike, that darkness surges back around, and Terra's keyblade fades a dark glow as he slashes the Heartless with darkness. Cut to Venetus and Xehanort watching from a distance, with Xehanort in deep focus and Venetus ready to jump in to clash with Terra. Xehanort quickly holds Venetus back, telling him that something strange happened with Terra in that moment when he was hit by the darkness, and it appeared that Terra temporarily use the darkness against it. Venetus is pissed off because his window of opportunity is dwindling and enough Heartless have fallen to them already, but Xehanort posits that such an occurrence would no longer make Terra a viable candidate, that they should rethink their plan and fall back immediately. Venetus, torn on what to do as he watches the Wayfinders finish off the Heartless, reluctantly retreats with Xehanort into a portal. The boss collapses in defeat as Terra is winded and confused over what just happened. Aqua and Ven quickly run up to Terra as the dark veil over his keyblade slowly fades away. Terra quickly quickly hugs them together, glad they're okay. Terra then asks what the Heartless just did to him, describing that it looked like it made him use the darkness. Aqua tries to play it off like it's not a big deal since it looks like it wore off, but Vend is overly concerned, suggesting that they should go talk to Master Ericus about it immediately. Terra ponders how the darkness could attach to him so easily like that, describing how it felt like it came from within him. Aqua and Ven are noticeably worried as they all rush back to the land of departure. For the remainder of this game, despite the fact that I'm still keeping it so that the story is told through three separate character stories, I'll mostly be changing things in chronological order for convenience. Here's some quick visual changes. Terra, Ven, and Aqua's armor should all have capes like they were originally intended. Apparently they ended up getting rid of their capes during the development of Birth by Sleep because they were way too graphically demanding for the PSP at the time, but that's no longer a limitation for us because this rewrite is under the assumption that these games are all released on modern home platforms, so the capes should come back because- <laughs> The next scene should have Terra, Ven, and Aqua arriving at the forecourt of the Land of Departure, dismounting their gliders and taking off their helmets one by one, revealing their faces as they walk inside. Cut to the trio standing before the Elder Council, minus Xehanort, in the Great Hall as the trio delivers their mission report. They relay mission success as they purged all the Heartless from the area, but Ericus responds that their mission is not yet complete because the number of Heartless appearing across the lands has increased as of recently. He notes that this is an abnormal occurrence, and that it likely means the darkness is planning a larger assault. Other members of the council continue that they received word from Master Yen Sid of a mysterious dark figure who wears a helmet, referring to Venetus, that has been spotted in multiple worlds, and that he may be commanding the Heartless from behind the scenes. The trio's special objective is to locate and capture this helmeted figure, and they will deploy in two days. As the council disbands, Ericus gleefully addresses the trio alone to talk more casually as they're his star pupils. Ven brings up what happened to Terra with the darkness, which Terra is visibly annoyed as he was hesitant to even bring it up. Terra explains that it appeared that he channeled the darkness for a brief second through his keyblade once the Heartless struck him. Ericus is in shock. Aqua chucks it up to being dark magical trickery that probably was a one-time fluke. Ericus injects that the use of darkness shouldn't even be possible among their soldier ranks, that they were trained to be strict agents of light, and that the use of darkness is strictly forbidden. Terra explains that there's no possible way he could replicate it, but Ericus responds that if he were to come in contact with the darkness again, the story could be different. Ericus is conflicted with being upset and feeling sympathetic as he thinks of Terra like a son. He adds that they must keep this to themselves, giving them leniency because he feels Terra would never purpose purposefully betray the light. Ericus tells Aqua and Ven to leave so that Terra and him may converse in private. They nervously oblige and leave the hall. Ericus and Terra begin to converse quietly. Ericus whispers that there is someone he knows who has been able to use the darkness in the past, but was able to successfully purge it from his heart. So Terra should seek his advice in private as soon as possible. That person will be able to tell Terra definitively whether or not this is something he should be concerned about. Terra asks who it is, to which Ericus quietly murmurs, 
Xehanort. We catch a scene of Aqua and Ven sitting outside the castle where they express what's going on in their head. We see the depth of their hatred for the darkness start to surface, as they're both incredibly anxious about what will happen to Terra knowing that using the darkness as forbidden and, in their minds, could turn Terra evil. But that's compounded with the doubt they feel knowing Terra is too strong to let the darkness do something like that, and that he would never betray them like that. Aqua mentions how he used that darkness to save them like he always has, so how could it possibly turn him evil? Ven states that darkness is their enemy no matter what, but Aqua responds that Terra is never their enemy. They sit in silence for a moment, but Aqua diffuses the awkwardness by teasing that even if Terra wanted to, he could never defeat the both of them. Ven chuckles and adds that he'll go for the legs while she takes his arms. They share a laugh and relax a bit, with Aqua adding that they're probably worked up over nothing because the darkness looks like it came and went. Aqua states that they should both rest up for the night and the two head out. The scene where Terra and Xehanort discuss the darkness is similar to how it is originally. Terra exits the hall and sits on the forecourt steps, thinking to himself how the darkness felt like it emerged from within his own heart, a detail he neglected to tell Ericus. He worries that if it had held on to him any longer, would he have hurt Aqua or Ven? At that moment, a portal appears before Terra and outsteps Master Xehanort, having been summoned in order to seek his advice. Terra greets him respectfully. Xehanort apologizes for being absent from the council briefing earlier as he had his research to attend to. Terra states that he asked to speak with him per Ericus's request and that he requests that it remain off the record. Xehanort agrees, seeming concerned. Terra tells Xehanort what happened with the Heartless and the Darkness. Xehanort asks if Terra is sure that it was the darkness, to which Terra confirms, adding that the force felt distinctly cold and harsh, unlike the light which he's used to. Xehanort replies that if he could feel the darkness, that must mean it came from within his own heart. Terra is stunned, shocked that Xehanort figured that out and afraid of what that could mean. With Terra unsure how to respond, Xehanort tells him not to worry, as he has experienced the same thing and that it's nothing to be ashamed of, continuing how once someone unleashes the darkness, there's no going back, and they can only choose to suppress it from there. He says that it isn't darkness or light that makes someone good or evil, but rather it's the actions they take. Terra, clearly skeptical, asks why they would suppress the darkness within their hearts at all if that's the case. Xehanort, having said enough for now, starts heading up the stairs, concluding by saying that Terra has nothing to worry about, saying that when he encountered the darkness himself all those years ago, it only brought him closer to the truth. Xehanort enters the castle, leaving Terra to ponder those words. Now one of the biggest letdowns in the original was just how small the Land of Departure section felt, and how there wasn't much of a world to explore. It made the whole beginning feel incredibly rushed, and contributed to why the Land of Departure was so empty and without context. So since the protagonists have two days to prep for their departure, they should spend a whole day in the world, and travel around different areas doing various tasks, in a similar vein to the intros of Cage 1 and Cage 2. Perhaps this day can organically introduce some of the various non-combat mechanics such as the command board and command melding, as well as an opportunity to add some story beats, spill some exposition about the world, and ultimately immerse you into the life the Soldiers of Light live. The map should be expanded to have a larger mountain area and even a town area. You get a sense of how revered Terra, Ven, and Aqua are across the world, with other soldiers addressing you respectfully and praising you as a hero. During this day, I think two specific cutscenes should take place. One should be the scene where Ericus approaches Aqua to discuss Terra in a way that sets her on a similar path as the original, where her secondary mission is to keep special tabs on Terra in the darkness that emerged within him. Another scene should be a confrontation between Xehanort and Venetis. As Xehanort is spending the day fulfilling his duties as an elder, he's secretly visited by Venetis, who is pissed about the mission yesterday. Venetis blasts Xehanort about course correcting last second, berating how he lost way too many Heartless, and questioning his loyalties to the cause. Xehanort calmly dismisses it, stating Terra unleashed the darkness within him, something that could prove more useful to them in the long run. After all, they both knew that simply clashing with Terra wouldn't have been enough, so they still have time to change targets and rework their plan. Venetis replies that he doesn't have time for Xehanort's chess game, but Xehanort suggests that they shift their sights on Master Aqua. Venetis' suspicions of Xehanort are at an all-time high, telling him that he'll go through with it, but that if Xehanort pulls a fast one again, their cooperation is over. As the day turns to night, that's when the scene of the trio chilling out underneath the stars should take place. The atmosphere of the scene is how much each character is worried about each other and doesn't want anything to split them apart, so instead of addressing what's going on in their heads revolving Terra, they just revert back to talking about and reminiscing on the memories they've had. This is a good opportunity to introduce a flashback detailing their time spent in training, a happy or funny memory to look back on in order to keep their minds off things. Some of the same beats from the original can return in this scene, like Aqua giving everyone their wayfinders, the whole ordeal about 
Ven, having never left the world, thus is enamored with the stars, simply isn't the case anymore. These characters regularly travel to other worlds on missions, so the stars are simply a beautiful sight to behold. Ven should mention the idea that there could be even more stars in the sky if they reclaim what was stolen by the darkness, which reminds Terra of what Xehanort said and starts to sour his mood. Terra ends the night on a serious note about how they should rest up for their mission tomorrow. Aqua nervously clutches her wayfinder as they walk away. So the mission the trio is going on sets them up on a similar trajectory, but instead of going on a chase fest trying to find each other, they're purposefully split up in order to locate the helmeted figure and defeat any and all darkness that appears across the worlds as efficiently as possible. Hi, welcome to Flashback Hour. I'm gonna take this time to describe flashback scenarios I think would bring valuable characterization to our characters. These flashbacks would be placed somewhere. I know which character story they would work best in, but I'm not exactly sure at what point in their story. Oh well, who cares? The first flashback will only be shown during Ventus' story. It should be about the early days of when our characters met in training. The flashback should be a montage of sorts, showing how when they first met, they didn't like each other because of how their personalities clashed, especially Terra and Ven. Terra was the rebellious, cocky one, and Ven was a young, goody two-shoes. Meanwhile, Aqua was an introvert who wanted nothing to do with either of them. Ven was also constantly picked on and outcast because he was so much younger than everyone. For their final assessment in training, the three are paired together together to complete a mission where they have to locate and defeat a large nobody, using all the skills they've learned thus far. They're thrust into an unknown terrain and use their tracking abilities and survival skills to hunt their target over a period of time. As the mission proves far more difficult than they anticipated, they get extremely frustrated with each other and constantly butt heads on what to do next. It seems hopeless, and like they're going to fail until finally after a long argument, they sit down and open up to each other, breaking down their barriers, allowing them to calm down and assess the situation. In doing so, they can finally locate the nobody and have to use each other's strengths to their advantage, draining every last bit of energy they had. Much to their surprise, they were hailed as the top performing group and graduated with honors. The group still butts heads, but earn mutual respect and solidify a friendship with each other. The second flashback will be a little darker, and only shown during Aqua's story. After being soldiers for a minute and getting a taste of real life or death combat against the forces of darkness, we find our trio in a period where they start to really struggle emotionally under the harsh realities of war, namely losing comrades and conflicting with their superiors. Now under the command of Ericus, the trio find themselves in a squad of Keyblade wielders to include a specific character, Ephemer who quickly hits it off with everyone being a natural-born leader and an all-around charismatic guy, becoming one of Terra's best friends. In a bold move, the Land of Departure intends to deploy a group of soldiers to a corridor of darkness in order to seize the area and close off the darkness from getting out. As Ephemer is appointed their leader, he leads them to the area where they are immediately ambushed and fight tooth and nail just to advance closer. As the forces of darkness ramp up more and more, including multiple dark sides and demon tides, the group is increasingly overwhelmed and considers a retreat. Ericus, in remote communication with Ephemer, directs them to stay the course and to do as much damage as possible. Realizing doing so will inevitably cause casualties, Ephemer's heart sinks. Terra approaches to ask what their plan of retreat is. Ephemer just looks at Terra with a terrified look, deeply conflicted on whether or not to obey orders. Ephemer reluctantly makes his decision and directs everyone to charge in. As everyone knows it's a suicide mission, Ephemer tries to inspire them by citing his full faith in the light and how it will lead them to the promised land. More on that later. Ephemer leads the charge and the squad reluctantly goes in for attack. As one soldier after another ends up completely overrun and is killed, Ephemer's resolve dwindles, realizing they have no chance. But it's too late, as the Heartless strike Ephemer with a fatal blow. Terra yells out his name, rushing to try and save him. Aqua and Ven rush after Terra, fearing for his life, as Terra screams out to the remaining soldiers to immediately retreat. After enormous struggle, Terra manages to retrieve Ephemer's body and rushes out with his glider. Cut to everyone regrouping after such an enormous loss, with multiple casualties including Ephemer, whose body is cradled in Terra's arms as it slowly fades away. Terra, Ven, and Aqua are sobbing, with Terra crying out how this cruel world took his best friend. The last flashback I'm going to tackle shows the moment Terra became a beloved hero across the lands, which plays during Terra's story. 
The scene shows Terra dashing on his glider throughout space, arriving out in the middle of the cosmos where we see a Chernabog, a massive dark creature that has appeared and had been terrorizing several worlds, spreading darkness and ruin. In front of Chernabog, we see Ven and Aqua, both binded and unconscious, essentially being held hostage. Terra shouts out their names to no response. Terra takes a deep breath and charges towards the Black God, and an epic clash sequence between Terra and Chernabog commences. This is Chernabog at full power, so it proves to be the toughest opponent Terra has ever faced, able to conjure massive storms of darkness and fire to constantly keep Terra on his toes, necessitating he evade with his glider and rely heavily on magic and projectiles until he maneuvers his way close enough, having taken many hits in the process, losing bits of his armor. As he gets closer, he's maybe able to get a few hits in before being flung all the way back. As Terra arduously pushes through the adversity, Terra is able to defeat Chernabog, releasing the binds on Aqua and Ven, and undoing the darkness that had been occupying the many worlds, freeing many residents from Terra. As Terra visits each of the affected worlds to make sure everyone is safe, he is greeted with massive cheers and praise for saving everyone. We then see Terra arriving in the Land of Departure before the Elder Keyblade Master is being commended for his grand heroism and seeing just how proud Ericus is of his star pupil. There's quite a lot about the progression of Terra's story that needs to change. Firstly, the darkness should still keep re-emerging at inconvenient times as Terra tries to suppress it, but in turn it ends up helping him defeat an enemy or complete a task in an unexpected way. Him gradually learning dark abilities and using his dark impulse command should be woven into the story early on, while being a regular game mechanic. Another theme I want to add to Terra's adventure is that he's constantly recognized by residents of each world he visits because, like I just established, he's like a famous soldier and tales of his heroism traverses the lands. Everyone's clearly rooting for him whenever he shows up and helps out, so the juxtaposition of him using the darkness to help out suggests that maybe the darkness ain't so bad. Also, Terra shouldn't learn about Xehanort's hand in the main conflict until much later, meaning a lot of what Xehanort was doing playing around with the princess's hearts and colluding with Disney villains is very different. It's just a metric fuck ton of smaller changes that I don't have the patience to modify every single one. A common theme in Ven's story should be that he and Venetus are continually destined to run into each other. The first time Ven encounters Venetus should be in the Dwarf Woodlands, which should be his very first sighting by any of the Wayfinders. As Ven chases after him, Venetus avoids engaging with him entirely, stating that he's not the one he seeks, because at this point Venetus has his sights set on Aqua. The fact that they encounter each other the most is an obvious sign of their fate to establish Ven as the most prominent opposing force in a way that Vanitas doesn't recognize until later. As Terra makes it through the first world, seeing his connection to the darkness fail to subside on its own, he seeks out further guidance from Master Xehanort at the Keyblade Graveyard, expressing his fear of the darkness inside him. Xehanort reaffirms that he shouldn't fear the darkness, which prompts Terra to begin pressing Xehanort on his positions. Terra explains that their goal has always been to eradicate the darkness by any means necessary, that was ingrained in them since they were little kids. Therefore, how could it possibly make sense to ignore the darkness within him? He expresses concern for Aqua and Ven, asking what if he hurts them, or turns on the Keyblade Masters as a whole. Xehanort knows that it's a difficult subject to convert someone on, so he proceeds delicately, first stating that he trusts Terra with the following information. Xehanort explains parts of his own journey, how he was once trapped in the realm of darkness and had to use the power of darkness in order to survive. He says he saw things in there he doesn't even know how to begin to explain. But his main takeaway from the experience was that the forces of darkness aren't all that unlike the forces of light. The Heartless fight because they believe the light is their enemy and are going to try and extinguish them. Xehanort poses that that's exactly the mission of the Land of Departure, is it not? Xehanort, through mere circumstance of being trapped for so long, began to wonder what exactly makes the light so much better than the darkness in the first place. It was important to his sanity to try and justify the supremacy of light, yet it was a question he struggled to answer the more he observed the darkness. Terra interjects that it's because those in the realm of light have hearts, while the darkness does not. Xehanort nods in disagreement, explaining how contrary to everything they're told to believe, Xehanort conducted his own research on the Heartless and discovered they actually do have hearts. Terra is instantly skeptical, claiming there's no way that's possible. Xehanort, with a sigh, summons a Heartless and uses a spell to quickly extract its heart, displaying it right before Terra's eyes. The Heartless's body lies lifeless. Terra is dumbfounded, completely speechless. 
Xehanort then transfers the heart back into the Heartless as they watch it sprout back to life, only for it to instantly teleport away. Terra's disbelief turns to fright, knowing such a prominent and well-known concept to be a complete falsehood from the start. Terra questions why no one else knows about this, to which Xehanort responds that Ericus was the first person to know when he made this discovery, but it was clear that he and the rest of the Elder Keyblade Masters didn't care, that such a fact changed nothing, and continuing to teach the lie was for the better. Terra is livid, exclaiming that it changes a lot, and how could they not see that? Xehanort, having said enough, leaves Terra with a simple request, to truly ask himself if the light is better than the darkness. Now when it comes to Aqua, her objective is of course fending off the darkness and looking for Vanitas, but she's mostly concerned with making sure Terra is alright so she can prove to Ericus that there's nothing to worry about. But as Terra's affinity for the darkness only increases, this starts to fall apart and she is forced to make decisions regarding whether or not she wants to be honest with her chain of command or protect Terra. Meanwhile, Vanitas is constantly seeking her out as he chose her as his opponent, but he has a tough time actually locating her most of the time for plot reasons. Towards the beginning of Aqua's journey, Vanitas actually finds her at the Castle of Dreams, formally introducing himself, going on about how the light has been in control for far too long and that it's time to balance the playing field. These words mean nothing to Aqua, so she just confirms he's the helmeted figure controlling the darkness and goes straight to trying to capture him. You have a battle with Vanitas, and once the fight ends, Vanitas is basically unscathed. He stares out at the castle in the distance, remarking that he knew that just fighting her wouldn't be enough. However, he then says that this world, Castle of Dreams, will be the fated place. What Vanitas is saying here will make more sense later. Aqua tries to charge at him, but he quickly teleports off, and that's that. Afterwards, Aqua meets up with Terra in the castle. She explains her encounter with Vanitas, and she notices Terra's distracted, clearly spacing out over something. As she pokes and pries to get him to explain what he's feeling, Terra tells her that Ericus and the council purposefully withheld information from everyone, explaining how the Heartless actually do have hearts. Aqua is confused, saying that that's impossible. Terra explains that Master Xehanort extracted a heart from one right in front of him. Aqua doesn't know what to think at first, but believes Terra would never lie to her, so she considers he's telling the truth. Aqua asks why Xehanort would show him such a thing, and Terra lets out that the council seems to know things they're not telling them, and that there must be something going on. Terra suggests they go talk with Ericus again, but Aqua reminds him that they first and foremost have a mission to fulfill, and that Vanitas is their primary objective. Aqua inquires about whether or not the darkness subsided within him, to which he hesitates, remembering everything Xehanort said. Terra softly relays that he doesn't want her and Ven to worry about him. Aqua asks if Terra himself is worried, which prompts Terra to let out that the darkness is still there, but that even if it never goes away, he's still Terra, and he'll always be there to protect his friends and do what's right. He gives a big, dumb smile that makes Aqua laugh, easing the tension a bit. Terra teases how Aqua went all mom mode for a minute, which Aqua rebuttals how she wouldn't have to if him and Ven would stop causing her so much stress. Terra says that next time Aqua sees Vanitas, she better call him and Ven up right away. Aqua justifies that she went easy on him because they need him alive. The two part ways with Terra leaving to seek further details about Vanitas from Yen Sid like he does originally, and once Aqua completes the rest of the world, she feels the need to report back to Ericus in order to quench her own doubts. So she heads back to the land of departure. Poopy, 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 poopy. The scene of Terra meeting Yen Sid can remain similar, talking about Mickey and how he was the first to spot Vanitas in another world, but during this scene, we should learn about Yen Sid's history with the Keyblade Masters and his perspective on how worlds are drifting apart and appear to have once been connected, but by a force he's yet to understand. But Terra also explains his darkness and how he feels betrayed by his superiors due to information they're not telling him about the darkness and hearts. Yen Sid argues that there are many secrets to worlds that he's always felt were being kept secret from him and everyone else, that if he wants answers it's best to seek it himself, and to always remain skeptical. When Aqua arrives in the Land of Departure, she meets with Ericus alone. Aqua is hesitant to relay information, not knowing what could happen to Terra, but chooses to do so, hoping Ericus could give her better guidance. Aqua also reluctantly mentions what Terra told her about the Heartless having hearts, which hits a nerve with Ericus, as that's something the Council has been trying to hide, and immediately knows Xehanort is the one who leaked it to Terra. Ericus begrudgingly admits this to Aqua's surprise. Aqua asks why they would make up such a big lie, to which Ericus nervously tries to downplay it by saying it doesn't make the Heartless any less cruel. Aqua asks what else they're not telling them. Ericus, feeling uneasy about lying to Aqua any further, confesses that Xehanort has made a lot of discoveries regarding the darkness, some of which contradicted previous conceptions, and that Xehanort and him both voted to disclose the information upon discovery, but the other council members felt that the old notion made better propaganda for soldiers, so majority ruled that it should remain secret. 
Aqua is clearly hurt by what is essentially a betrayal of leadership and is left unable to form words, while Ericus is extremely nervous about why Xehanort would disclose information like that to Terra. Ericus can only start to form an apology to Aqua before she interjects, expressing that Terra's already had his concerns about leadership and this is only going to make things worse. Ericus levels with Aqua, explaining that if Ericus caused a rift in the council over such things, it would only hurt the council and form cracks that the enemy could exploit. He reminds her that Terra's darkness will continue to grow if not properly suppressed and that Xehanort might be trying to take advantage of that. Aqua asks why Xehanort would want to do that. Ericus doesn't know what exactly Xehanort is thinking, but knows there was once a time when Xehanort held sympathy for the darkness and that Ericus fears that sympathy never subsided. Aqua doesn't know what to think about the whole ordeal, but knows that Terra's in trouble, so she asks what she should do. Ericus recommends she take a break from searching for Vanitas and to focus solely on locating Xehanort, and to start by asking Terra so that Ericus can handle Xehanort. When Ven and Aqua meet in the Enchanted Dominion, they catch each other up. Ven explains how Vanitas might be going after her or Terra, while Aqua realizes that since Vanitas completely ignored Ven, but made it a point to seek Aqua and formally introduce himself and everything, that might mean Vanitas is actually going after her. The two struggle to decipher what all of this means. Aqua relays that if Ven spots Xehanort, then to tell her right away, as Master Ericus is looking for him, explaining that Xehanort may be trying to manipulate Terra. Ven is clearly shocked as he had zero idea that Xehanort could do such a thing, sparking him to ask more questions than Aqua can answer, so Aqua defers to the fact that she needs to find Terra and ask him because she also has no idea what's going on. Around here is when Ven encounters Vanitas in space and follows him to the Keyblade Graveyard. Ven asks him about what he wants with Aqua, but Vanitas writes him off as a dumb kid who don't want this smoke, and they duke it out. Vanitas knocks Ven back, and Mickey swoops in like he did originally. Vanitas calls out to them, Keyblade wielders from the realm of light, show me what you're made of and the fight continues. As Ven and Mickey secure the victory, Vanitas commends them for their strength, but says it's unfortunate the Keyblade was wasted on their shallow goals. Mickey asks what his goal is, to which he responds to take back what the light stole. As Ven and Mickey are both confused, Vanitas claims he doesn't have time to convince them and teleports away. Moving on over to Radiant Garden. I think sprinkled among the various NPCs around town, we should see younger versions of Leon, Yuffie, Cloud, Aerith, and Tifa chilling around, with dialogue vaguely resembling stuff about their stories. Just some cool easter eggs. Now let's talk about the scene where Aqua protects Kairi and the idea of Keyblade succession, where a Keyblade wielder can pass on the power of the Keyblade to someone who grabs their Keyblade. The parameters of this succession is very unclear because Kairi simply touched it by accident, but when Terra passed it to Riku, it was a very intentional and almost ceremonial moment. I guess you can say Aqua did intend to do so, especially because she bestowed Kairi with a protective charm to lead her light to another's, but that didn't directly have to do with the Keyblade successions, and also Riku handed Kairi her Keyblade in Cage 2, so it just seems a little loosey-goosey, and considering there are multiple ways one can attain a Keyblade in the original, I think the concept of inheriting the Keyblade should just be removed entirely, and it should solely be attainable through the way I mentioned in Part 1, where it's based on merit and strength of heart. So the scene of Aqua protecting Kairi can remain pretty much exactly what it was. The scenario where Terra, Ven, and Aqua all meet up in Radiant Garden and fight the large boss can remain similar. After they team up, Ven gives everyone their tickets to Disney Town, Aqua begins addressing her concerns to Terra, Terra finds out that Aqua has been reporting to Ericus about Terra without him knowing, and despite the fact that they're all under Ericus's command, because of Terra's mixed feeling about the command to begin with, as well as the new info that they've been keeping information from them, Terra feels betrayed that Aqua would go behind his back like that when his friends are about the only people he knew he could always trust. And while Aqua tries to apologize, Terra's too hurt to deal with it. I think now Ven should mostly understand where Aqua was coming from, from because it was a direct order, and also should think that Terra is overreacting, conflating it with Terra's darkness. Ven yells out about how Aqua was only following orders, but Terra says that following orders only made them blind to the lies. Ven replies that the elders only wanted to protect them from the darkness. Terra exclaims that there's nothing to protect him from because the darkness hasn't changed him. Ven lets out that he isn't so sure about that, noting Terra's sudden distrust in their superiors. Terra once again feels hurt by that statement, expressing how he's actually felt this way ever since what happened to Ephemer. Ven has no response, remembering how devastating of a loss that was to everybody. After a sigh, Terra explains that they need to trust that he can handle himself and that the elders don't need to get involved. Aqua then asks why Xehanort got involved then. There's a pause, and Terra responds, it's because Xehanort and I are the same. Foreshadowing! Terra walks off to find Xehanort, having spotted him earlier, and Aqua and Ven, feeling defeated, let him go. While Ven is still convinced the darkness is pushing Terra away, Aqua understands Terra's sentiment and feels hesitant to put their full faith into their leaders. The two express this disagreement, things get slightly heated, 
and Venon Aqua part ways as well. Here's a good opportunity to talk about Brag, or I guess in a broader sense, Zigbar and or Lushu. My intent with this rewrite is to wrap everything up with Kingdom Hearts 3. So while I do ultimately love the reveal of Lushu's identity in the original, and I'm super curious where that's headed, I don't really intend to develop anything else for the future of Kingdom Hearts past Kingdom Hearts 3. I have no idea where the story with Lushu and the Foretellers are going, so I think for the purpose of my rewrite, Brag is simply a loyal follower of Xehanort. The scenario where Brag and Terra fight as a sort of ruse orchestrated by Xehanort can remain, but needs some tweaks. First off, Brag shouldn't be pretending to hold Xehanort hostage with some chains. Obviously some BS like that would never restrict a veteran Keyblade wielder, and Terra should know that. Also, how could Brag possibly threaten to kill Xehanort if he's all the way over there? Huh? It makes no sense. There's no hostage situation. Brag simply corners Terra, threatens him over his Keyblade, and Brag gets him to the point where Terra unleashes even more darkness in order to secure the fight. The point of this is so that it forces Terra to stop holding back so much on using the darkness, to show him that no matter how much darkness he unleashes, he's still in control. In fact, it will only make him stronger. Once Brag retreats, Terra spots Xehanort watching him from afar. As they approach each other, Terra expresses concern for using so much darkness, but Xehanort quickly reassures him that Terra displayed total control. Terra starts to break down a bit, saying how Ericus had Aqua spy on him in order to make sure the darkness subsided. Xehanort talks about how Ericus and the others fear the darkness without ever attempting to truly understand it. Terra, continuing to break down, pleads with Xehanort to help him understand going on about how Xehanort said there were more secrets being kept from them and how he wants to know. Xehanort budges, telling him that Terra's heart was not infected by the darkness, but rather he unlocked the darkness that was already there in the first place. He continues that all hearts are made of both light and darkness, and how soldiers of light are never taught to use the darkness within them, so their full potential is always left untapped. When Xehanort unleashed the darkness, he too feared that it would change him. But it's not the darkness itself that changes a person, but rather that by learning and understanding the darkness and seeing how it too can be used for good and how the light can be used for evil, it shatters everything they thought they knew about the darkness. That's when one begs the question, why do the Heartless fight? What are they fighting for? Do they fight for the same reasons the light does, or is there something more going on? Terra's overwhelmed, admitting that he's not sure if he believes what he's hearing. Xehanort admits he can't prove it to him this time around, so he requests that Terra find out himself, that perhaps he locates this Vanitas guy and ask him, beating the answers out of him if he must. Feeling a bit uneasy, Terra agrees. At this point in Ventus' story, I want there to be a greater development of Lee and Isa. Who are they, and what are they doing? Because I stated in part 2 that Isa is one of Xehanort's personal disciples, I want to create a scenario introducing that idea. Lee and Isa should both be considered hoodlums around Radiant Garden, committing petty crimes like thieving, and ultimately being without guidance or direction. One day, the two are approached by Xehanort, who is looking for vulnerable people to assist him in his plans in exchange for serving a greater purpose, restoring balance and toppling the current order. Xehanort shared lots of info regarding his views and the things he's learned, as outcasts of society, the idea of burning the current world to the ground appeals to both Isa and Lee, and they become cult followers of Xehanort. In the scene where Lee and Isa encounter Ven, I want things to be pretty different. Ven, still recovering from the heated argument with Terra, sees Lee and Isa on the run as they're chased by Scrooge McDuck, having just stolen something from his shop. Ven springs to action to chase after them, and you have a chase minigame around town. Once you catch each, you have a quick fight with both of them. One detail I'd like to change about young Lee and Isa is that they should actually have their organization weapons at this point, having been gifted to them by Xehanort in order to better serve him. Once you mop the force with Lee and force him to give back what he stole, Lee is more impressed with the Keyblade and how strong Ven is, rather than really caring that he lost. Once you defeat Isa, he's admittedly less than pleased, but still cracks a smirk at your skills. After parting ways, we see Isa and Lee sneak down an alleyway where we catch Xehanort and Brag conversing. Brag is asking what's taking these kids so long just as they roll around the corner. Xehanort gives a warm greeting and proceeds to brief them about how his plans are escalating and he needs them to be on standby because they must play an important role. Brag and Isa agree without question to follow him no matter what, while Xehanort senses hesitation hesitation in Lee. After he dismisses them, he tells Isa to stay back, where he talks about how Lee's heart seems to be wavering. Isa pleads with Xehanort to give Lee a chance, explaining how he just needs to prove himself. Xehanort says there's no longer time to conduct purity tests. Isa tries to say something, but Xehanort suggests that maybe Isa feels hesitant as well, and sees his friendship with Lee as more important. Isa assures that that's not the case, and Xehanort considers giving Lee one last chance to show his dedication. Xehanort summons a portal, telling Isa to be ready at a moment's notice, and teleports away. 
Some more character scenes I think should be added throughout each story is to include encounters with Masters Braggy, Hermode, Ord, and Vor. As our protagonists trudge through the Disney worlds, there should be moments where they're visited by one or two of the elders who are there to essentially check up on you and spill exposition about the lights. What is this fucking sentence? As our protagonists trudge through the Disney world, there should be moments where they're visited by one or two of the elders who are there to essentially check up on you and spill exposition about the light's perspective on things and history, perhaps swooping in to help you fend off a heartless or two. Since these four elders aren't really aware of Terra's darkness, the goal here is to give you a brief look into these old masters and just how uneasy they make you feel due to how absolutely dedicated they are to the supremacy of light, almost like crazy evangelists. As I'm setting these characters up to play important roles come the rest of the series, it's important that they should be somewhat established in this way. I think these cutscenes will pretty much regurgitate the expanded lore and details I've already discussed in the beginning, so I won't go into specifics to avoid redundancy. I want to talk about the Mirage Arena. I think it should be expanded to add more valuable extra content to the game. What we got originally felt very tacked on, not even having a story, without much of the variety and flair of what you expect out of an arena. I think it should be way more akin to something like the Olympus Coliseum, where it's a regular world with a whole story involved. You can fight waves of enemies and bosses and tournaments, refighting bosses from previous worlds and whatnot, and I also see a good opportunity to add special Disney and Final Fantasy bosses. When the developers were creating the Mirage, arena, they originally planned for Laguna Loire from Final Fantasy VIII to appear as head of the arena. They ended up not doing it because of some cross-development with the Dissidia game at the time, but I think it's an awesome idea. So Laguna should definitely be the head of the arena, and he himself can be a special boss in one of the tournaments. Imagine Keyblades versus a machine gun. Ah! Other special bosses I'd personally love to see are Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, with abilities like he uses in Epic Mickey where he helicopters around with his ears, uses his arm as a boomerang, has a remote that activates traps and gizmos and things. Just very cartoony and kind of a troll. I'd also like to see Lightning from Final Fantasy XIII. She's a character many people have wanted in Kingdom Hearts for a long time, so she should be introduced here as her younger self, similar to young Zack in this game. Perhaps with a simple backstory about her participating in the games in order to get enough money to help save her sister Sarah, and that's kind of all you get in this game. She will appear in later installments alongside the rest of the Final Fantasy game because that sounds dope as fuck. The story of the Mirage Arena should be a gladiator-style arena where people from around the universe fight, make some money, show off. Nothing we haven't seen before in countless video games, but the reason our protagonists are interested in the arena in the first place is, of course, because of Vanitas. Vanitas shows up in the world to spread the Heartless, with Heartless showing up in the tournaments, but Vanitas also stops to challenge warriors from the Realm of Light in order to gauge their strength and different abilities, and also to maybe blow off some steam. When Aqua and Terra show up, they're simply fending off Heartless and trying to gather intel on Vanitas and where he might be heading next. And once all the story stuff plays out, the player can unlock different tournaments and special matches as they progress throughout the game, just like the Olympus Coliseum of past games. I mean, if it ain't broke. There should be a scene with Ericus encountering and fighting Xehanort. One, it would be super badass, and two, it will mark Ericus's breaking point. We catch Xehanort in the Keyblade Graveyard where Ericus teleports before him. Ericus remarks, how did I know I'd find you here, and talks about how Xehanort missed the past few council meetings. Xehanort remarks that he's been far too busy with his research, but Ericus knows that's always his excuse. Ericus cuts the formalities and starts grilling Xehanort about Terra, demanding to know what Xehanort has been telling him. Xehanort doesn't hold back, saying that he told Terra the truth. Ericus reminds him that the council classified that information, but Xehanort responds that they've been feeding everyone lies. Ericus levels with him, saying how he doesn't disagree that these things should be kept a secret, but the council must remain unanimous, and that if they sow division, the enemy will exploit their weakness. Xehanort secretly grins, then turns around and says that he's done playing politics just to maintain the illusion of solidarity, explaining that he sees himself within Terra and how he struggled all those years ago, that Terra needs the guidance that he never got. Xehanort reminds Ericus that people thought something was wrong with him simply because he learned to use the darkness for his own survival in the Dark Realm, and they called him a madman for suggesting the darkness wouldn't change him. Ericus suggests that it did change him, that he was never the same again after emerging from the Dark Realm. Xehanort exclaims that that's because he was shown the reality of the darkness and how much they've been lied to. That if only Ericus had seen what he'd seen. Ericus expresses that he always had a suspicion Xehanort never gave up on those feelings, the obsession with darkness that he swore to them he suppressed. Xehanort proclaims that he has an obsession not with the darkness but with the truth, and the truth of the matter is that darkness and light are a balance 
balance that must always be maintained, and that mindlessly displacing the darkness with more light only brings Kingdom Hearts closer to ruin. Ericus is furious, unable to believe what he's hearing, expressing how he cannot allow his comrades to fall to darkness, nor can he let Xehanort turn his back on what the light has worked so hard to build for countless generations. Ericus demands that Xehanort give up on his foolishness immediately. Xehanort scoffs at his best friend's demand, saying that what's to be done has already been set in motion. Ericus draws his keyblade in anger, demanding to know what he's done. Xehanort draws his back, telling him he'll know soon enough and it's nothing he can stop now. The two elders fight in an epic clash, with both displaying their full proficiency as lifelong masters. In the end, Xehanort is able to strike Ericus's face with a dark fire, branding his two scars, dropping him to his knees. Xehanort turns the other direction, upset that it's come to this knowing he can never reach his best friend. He parts with Ericus by telling him that this is the only way he can save Kingdom Hearts and lead them back to the promised land Master Odin always dreamed about. Xehanort teleports away, leaving Ericus regaining his stance, fighting back tears of frustration. A wounded and exhausted Xehanort arrives in Radiant Garden in the middle of the night. He summons Brag, Isa, and Lee for an emergency meeting, relaying that the time is now and that their plan is about to commence. With no doubts in their minds, Brag and Isa are prepared for the roles they must play, while Lee still seems to move with a sense of hesitancy. Xehanort takes note of this and watches closely. Around this time is when Terra should head to Destiny Islands. When Terra meets Riku, because of the removal of Keyblade Succession, the interaction needs to be tweaked. Honestly, the fact that Riku never alluded to Terra in the original after going through such a special moment was a continuity asshole. So when Terra meets Riku, it should be much more muted and brief, something less memorable. Terra, who's just staring out at the sea like a weirdo, sees a young Riku approach him, asking him who he is. Terra and Riku ask some questions here and there, with Riku noting how he wants to become strong and protect his friends, as well as how little he knows beyond his own island. Terra recognizes that heart and determination, saying how he doesn't know many of the answers he once thought he did, but that if Riku trains hard and keeps his friends close, Riku could find the answers someday. Riku has to leave, and that's that. Not an interaction that Riku would remember super vividly, but one that leaves a subconscious impression on him as he grows older. The next part is another completely new scenario I want to introduce that I think fits super well and ties in the direction I want to take things better. Right after Terra visits Destiny Islands, we catch him traveling through space where he spots Vanitas. Terra instantly follows him and they head to the Castle of Dreams. As Terra arrives, he spots Vanitas standing in the forest, staring at the castle in the distance like he was before with Aqua. Terra calls out to get his attention, approaching with caution. He tells Vanitas that he doesn't want to fight, he just wants to talk, and he desummons his Keyblade. Vanitas calls out to him as Terra, the one he originally set his sights on, saying it's nice to finally meet him. Terra begins by explaining that he unleashed the power of darkness, and it made him realize that what he knew about the darkness was wrong. He says that he's been lied to by his masters and wishes to hear from the darkness's perspective on what exactly they're fighting for. Vanitas says that that must be why Xehanort had him shift targets, because he wants to convince Terra. Terra's immediately shocked, demanding to know how he knows Xehanort. Vanitas sidesteps, answering that their goal isn't just about fighting the light. He explains that Kingdom Hearts is in pain, due to the forces of light and dark being imbalanced, spilling exposition about how Kingdom Hearts is the lifeblood of the entire universe, and that so long as light continues to oppress the darkness, the universe will grow weaker and weaker. He fights to restore Kingdom Hearts and reclaim the balance that was lost. Terra questions how he plans to achieve that, to which Vanitas responds that darkness must prove to Kingdom Hearts that it's ready to fight back. Suddenly, a bunch of Heartless start spawning, completely surrounding Terra. He draws his Keyblade, asking what Vanitas is doing. Vanitas tells Terra if he truly wants to understand the darkness, he must feel the fear they felt their entire life. Vanitas teleports away, and what seems like thousands of Heartless, both large and small, start to completely swarm the world, many of which begin heading towards the castle. Terra, realizing how bad the situation is, sends an emergency signal through his shoulder armor, calling Ven and Aqua to his location. As Ven and Aqua receive the signal, both assuming it means Terra found Vanitas, they immediately rush to the world. We find Terra trying to locate and protect the people in the castle. As enemies overwhelm him, King Mickey arrives, having been guided there by his Star Shard. Terra insists that Mickey evacuate the residents to another world, to which Mickey agrees and does so without hesitation. As Terra fights his way to the courtyard, he's greeted by a dark side, and you have a battle. 
Aqua arrives in the forest, seeing the sheer mass of Heartless swarming the entire area, and realizes that there's no way they could face them on their own. That's when Aqua thinks to call upon the Nobodies, and with a flick of her Keyblade, she spawns as many Nobodies as she can to help push back against the Heartless. While they can manage the smaller enemies, as larger Heartless continue to pile up, she realizes they can't hold them off forever. That's when she spots Vanitas walking towards her. She calls out to him, assuming he's responsible for what's happening. Vanitas points his Keyblade to her, and tells her that this encounter was their destiny, and that they'll settle this right here, right now. And the two begin fighting. Ventus arrives at the chateau, spotting Cinderella and Jacques surrounded by Heartless. He rushes in to save them, finding himself assisted by the nobodies. Cinderella and Jacques are surprised to see Ven at normal size. As enemies keep piling up, Fairy Godmother teleports out of nowhere, assuring she'll protect Cinderella. When Ven asks if she knows where Terra is, she tells them he's back at the castle. They teleport away, and Ven hurries in that direction. Cut back to Aqua fighting Vanitas, and he lands a heavy blow on her, knocking her back. That's when Ven swoops in and forces him back. Vanitas yells at him to get out of the way, but Ven remarks how he won't let him hurt Aqua, and the two fight their little hearts out. As Aqua recovers, she's witnessing the clash between Ven and Vanitas. That's when a blindingly bright yellow light bursts right before Vanitas, the force of which blasts Ventus back towards Aqua. As Terra finishes off the dark side in the courtyard, he notices the huge flash of light in the distance and immediately mounts his glider to head in that direction. Vanitas is shielding his eyes from the light as the brightness slowly subsides, revealing the Golden Keyblade, the Kingdom Key D. Ventus and Aqua stare dumbfounded. Vanitas slowly reaches out and holds it in his hand. He closes his eyes and takes a deep breath. Suddenly, Terra zooms in on his glider and launches towards Vanitas. Vanitas quickly evades his attack as Terra joins Aqua in Ven's sides. Terra stares at the Kingdom Key D, still radiating, demanding to know what it is. Vanitas, ignoring his question, points it towards Aqua, telling her that when the Keyblade that looks similar to this one appears before her, come find him. He then flies upwards, grabbing the Kingdom Key D with both hands, pointing it upwards. The keyhole for the Castle of Dreams appears in the sky. Vanitas laments to himself how the Heartless' sacrifice won't be in vain. Without hesitation, Vanitas unlocks the keyhole. Immediately, a massive amount of darkness begins surging out of the keyhole as Terra, Ven, and Aqua push against the wind. A dark storm ball begins to conjure high in the sky as thousands of shadows and neo shadows surround them. Off in the distance, they witness several dark sides rise from the trees. Vanitas teleports away, leaving Terra, Ven, and Aqua desperately fighting the darkness, Thousand Heartless style but to no avail, as the darkness soon overwhelms them. The world begins crumbling around them, trees ripped from the ground, masses of land breaking apart. The force of the storm begins to pull the trio upwards. They try to grab onto each other, but barely miss, as they're all sucked into the storm, which shoots them out of the world to different places. We find Ventus floating unconsciously in space. A bright white light causes him to wake, and as he peers before him, he sees the Kingdom Key. Still half asleep, he reaches out to grab it. That's when he snaps all the way awake, remembering everything that just went down. He immediately calls out for Terra and Aqua, with them nowhere in sight. He then stares down at the Kingdom Key in his hand, horrified as it resembles the Golden Keyblade Vanitas grabbed. That's when Xehanort is seen floating towards Ven. Xehanort says he never imagined Ventus of all people would be Vanitas' counterpart, but he thinks back and realizes it makes sense as they were abnormally drawn to each other. Ven is livid, finding out that Xehanort is in on everything regarding Vanitas and demands to know what he's doing to Terra. Xehanort tells Ventus not to worry about Terra, as he's finally accepted balance in his own heart, and Ven would be wise to follow suit. Xehanort explains that Ven holds the Kingdom Key, and that Vanitas holds the Kingdom Key Dark Side. He says that they've been chosen by the legendary Kingdom Keys to determine the fate of Kingdom Hearts, spilling exposition about the history of the Keyblade War, and how the opposing forces clashed in hopes of merging to form God's Key, the Key of Hearts. Xehanort proclaims it is their fate, their destiny to clash, and whoever's will is the strongest shall claim the Key of Hearts and its dominion over Kingdom Hearts. He tells Ven to know in his heart what he fights for, to channel his resolve, and to meet Vanitas at the Keyblade Graveyard, teleporting away shortly after. Ventus is feeling a lot of things at this point. The devastation, the confusion, the lies, anger, anxiety. Why him? Is Xehanort lying? What could they possibly want with this supposed Key of Hearts? The only thing he can think to do in this situation is report back to the Land of Departure and warn his masters. Terra crash landed in Radiant Garden. As he regains himself, he feels nothing but anger and regret. He failed to save the Castle of Dreams, to stop Vanitas, and was betrayed by Xehanort, knowing he kept his cooperation with Vanitas a secret from him. 
he feels nothing but the weight of his failure, blaming only himself knowing he could have stopped Vanitas earlier if he hadn't tried to talk to him. And I think the only appropriate reaction from him at this moment is an emotional breakdown right there in the central square. After that, he remembers Aqua and Ven, fearing something could have happened to them, so he quickly sets off on his glider to find them. Aqua crash lands in the waters of Destiny Islands, where she makes it to shore and sits in defeat, crying with her head between her knees. After a while, she's approached by a young Riku in Sora, asking if she's okay. Aqua's clearly not in the mood, so she simply says she's fine. They introduce themselves and ask if she's from another world, and through them, she's reminded of Terra and Ven, and the interaction is kind of similar to the original, but she knows that she has to leave to make sure her friends are okay, so she parts ways with them. Ventus arrives at the Land of Departure, where he's immediately greeted by Ericus. Ven tells him everything, what happened to the Castle of Dreams with Venetus, the Kingdom Keys, and what Xehanort said to Ven. Ericus is in complete disbelief at the situation, as Ventus shows him the Kingdom Key. Ven pleads to Ericus to tell him what's going on. Ericus tells Ven that they can't trust anything Xehanort is saying, as he's proven a traitor, but Ventus finally snaps, asking how he knows he can trust Ericus either, bringing up how he's kept all these secrets from them. Ericus is tired of the same questions, declaring it necessary to ensure their victory against the darkness. Ericus knows he can't allow Xehanort to control the situation, so he demands that Ventus hand over the Kingdom Key to him immediately. Ven is shocked. Ven tells Ericus that Xehanort said the Kingdom Key chose him. Ericus shouts to him to just do it. Hesitating, Ven hands it over. But to no avail, the Kingdom Key summons right back to Ven. Looking with horror, Ericus stumbles back, knowing that the only way to ensure Xehanort can't get his hands on Ventus is for Ventus to die. Realizing what that might mean, Ventus goes pale. Ericus, clearly at his breaking point, knows what he must do and raises his Keyblade to Ventus, telling him that they must prevent Xehanort from winning no matter what. Ventus yells out to his master, saying there has to be another way. Ericus sheds a tear, saying how sorry he is. Ventus, unprepared to die, instinctually braces with the Kingdom Key to protect himself. Ericus goes in to attack, and, like it is originally, Terra swoops in at the last second to protect him. Same spiel goes down where Ericus tells Terra to move out of the way, but Terra will protect his friend no matter what. Terra notices Ven holding the Kingdom Key and gasps, telling Ven to teleport away. Ven refuses, Terra yells louder, Ven finally says, Okay, and leaves. And we have Ericus versus Terra. Ericus tells Terra that they're being manipulated by Xehanort, who plans to dismantle the Land of Departure, but Terra is far more concerned that Ericus raised his weapon to Ven. Ericus remarks how Terra fails to see the big picture and that the darkness has turned him against his masters, but Terra corrects that his loyalties were shattered ever since the death of Ephemer, when Ericus purposefully led him to his death. Ericus responds that that's a lie, that the lives of his soldiers meant everything to him, and that he sees Terra and Ven like sons, but that hard decisions have to be made and individual lives can't stand in the way of a brighter future. Terra states that he'll never let Ericus hurt Ven as the darkness starts to surface within him, forming a dark glow. The two both don their Keyblade armors, and you have a battle more similar to the armor of Ericus' battle. Ericus is brutally defeated and falls to his knees as Terra catches him. Ericus is finally snapped out of his rage and concedes to Terra that he's acted out of pure frustration and that he can't believe he ever lifted a finger to his sons like that. Terra feels instant regret at what he's done, trying to say he's sorry that he let Xehanort manipulate him. Ericus says he understands and he himself fears that Xehanort might be right after all. He then says to Terra that he always regretted his decision to command Ephemer to his death, and that he never had a clear understanding of the situation. He put blind faith into his soldiers that they could accomplish whatever was needed of them. Terra breaks into tears, telling Ericus that he only ever wanted to do what's right and protect his friends. Ericus smiles, saying he now has faith that Terra will do what's right. He pleads that he must stop Xehanort and protect Ventus at all costs. Ericus fades away due to his injuries. Terra is mortified by what he's just done, and then boom. Xehanort appears. Xehanort expresses disappointment that his dear friend was too blinded by his indoctrination to ever acknowledge the truth. Terra stares with pure hatred, expressing that Xehanort lied to him from the start. Xehanort responds that everything he's told him was the truth, but shifting one's worldview is a delicate process. Thus, he proceeded with caution. Terra shouts that he'll never side with him, not after destroying the Castle of Dreams and pinning him against his master. Xehanort pleads with Terra to understand that this is their only opportunity to correct the balance of light and darkness, and that he had to get his hands dirty in order to set things right. Terra vows that he'll never let Xehanort get his hands on Ven, but Xehanort replies that Ven and Venetus' destinies are already intertwined and they are fated to find each other regardless if he runs and hides. That such is the nature of the Kingdom Keys. 
He goes on to say that the light has overconsumed the darkness, causing the universe to slowly decay, and that the land of departure has been at the center of these affairs for far too long. That's when we see Vanitas show up out of nowhere, and before Terra has a chance to react, Vanitas quickly unlocks the keyhole of the land of departure, sending darkness surging into the world. Terra tries to catch Vanitas, but he quickly teleports away before he gets the chance. Xehanort tells Terra that this will all be settled at the fated place, the Keyblade Graveyard. At that moment, Bragi, Hermod, Urd, and Vor rush out of the Grand Hall to witness the commotion as the world fills with Heartless and the Dark Storm emerges once again. Xehanort gives his fellow elders one last last stare down before teleporting away, as the elders quickly prepare to defend their world. Terra looks back at them, but knowing he has to hurry and protect Ven, he chooses to dip the fuck out. Hermod demands Terra stay behind and protect the world, but fails to reach him as Terra glides away. We see the army of soldiers start to storm the mountain, prepared for battle. The elders don their Keyblade armors, ready to protect their world. The scene ends there. Aqua is drawn to the mysterious tower in much the same way by discovering an unconscious Mickey in space, having exhausted himself evacuating the Castle of Dreams, bringing him to Yen Sid, and then hearing word from Yen Sid that Ericus was struck down by Xehanort and Terra, the latter of whom is heading to the Keyblade Graveyard. When our trio meets up at the Keyblade Graveyard, they catch each other up on everything. Terra takes a moment to blame himself for not recognizing Xehanort's malice sooner, as Xehanort's manipulated all of them to this point. Aqua fears that if what Xehanort and Vanitas have said is true, that means that fighting the darkness like they've done their entire lives has only made things worse, and that it may have been for nothing. What they know for sure is that Ven is in trouble, and they have to protect him at all costs. Ven pleads that they can avoid all of this if Terra and Aqua put an end to him now. Horrified by that answer, Aqua immediately responds they'd never let that happen. Terra admits that their friendship is the only thing he has, and he doesn't know what he'd do if he lost them. They protected each other their entire lives, not because of some allegiance to light, but because their hearts are intertwined. That even if the darkness did change Terra, it could never change how much he cares about them. Ven, brought to tears, expresses how much he loves his friends. That's when Vanitas and Xehanort pull up. Before they approach the Wayfinders, we see them exchange some words. Vanitas reminds Xehanort that this plan is still very theoretical, that if the Key of Hearts is forged, they have literally no idea what could happen. Xehanort tells Vanitas that in any case things go astray, to not hesitate to use the fail-safes he set in place. Vanitas raises his Keyblade to Xehanort threatening him that if he changes course at the last minute again, he's going through with it with or without him. Xehanort grins smugly and throws it right back, saying in a similar fashion that if Vanitas can't secure the Key of Hearts, he'll finish the job. That's when they approach the Wayfinder trio, and epic Kingdom Hearts cinematics ensue. Now, the epic showdown can't remain exactly the same. Obviously, Ventus and Vanitas are now wielding the Kingdom Keys. Xehanort grabbing Ven's head and freezing him is kind of a stretch, because Ven isn't a helpless kid, he's a full-fledged badass. So instead of grabbing his head, Xehanort should sort of freeze him by surprise, sending him down the mountain all the same. And summoning Kingdom Hearts in the sky doesn't make any sense right now, so we'll save that for later. Terra facing off against Xehanort atop the pillar can remain. I think Vanitas should jump down right away, leaving a final battle solely between Terra and Xehanort. Xehanort tells Terra that they're much the same and that he wanted Terra to stand by his side as the plan came to fruition. Terra responds that if he thinks he would ever agree to hurting one of his best friends, he doesn't know the first thing about him. Xehanort tries to reiterate that the Kingdom Keys can correct the universe and put an end to the centuries of violence and bloodshed, but Terra can no longer trust what he says. Commence Terra vs. Xehanort, the last battle of Terra's story. And yes, I say the last battle because I don't think there should be another stage with you playing as the Lingering Will. It's incredibly repetitive, and story-wise, I want to do something different. So this battle between Terra and Xehanort goes all out gameplay-wise. When it comes to Ven and Aqua, things are going to differ quite a bit. As Aqua is trying to thaw Ven, Brig, Isa, and Lee appear, weapons in hand, and knock Aqua away from Ven. Basically, their goal is to ensure Aqua stays out of the way long enough for the plan to commence. So Aqua has a fight against all three in a bombastic triple battle. Aqua notices that Isa and Lee are nervous, which disturbs Aqua that Xehanort would recruit such inexperienced kids. Mickey joins in to help her, and this five-way battle commences. Since Aqua gets another big fight later, I think having this fight be her sole fight at the Keyblade Graveyard cuts the repetitiveness of having to fight Vanitas yet again, and the battle can be in a similar cadence to something like the Xehanort trio battle in KH3, where they sort of trade attacks and whatnot. Some subtle details of this fight should see it mostly being led by Brig, with Isa and Lee being cautious and only chiming in when necessary. Lee should be the most cautious, almost hesitant. However you would portray that in gameplay, yeah. We see Vanitas fall from the sky and land dramatically before Ven's icy body. 
Ven slowly tries to shimmy his way out of the popsicle and prepares to face off against him. Vanitas commends Ventus for actually showing up and not trying to run from their destiny. Ven expresses how he didn't ask for any of this, and Vanitas replies that he didn't ask to be born in darkness and suffer fear and pain his entire life, explaining how the light took his home and killed so many people he cared about, and for what? He continues that from this day forward, the darkness will no longer fear fighting back, and will reclaim what was stolen from them. Vanitas' helmet fades away, revealing his face as he stares at Ventus with his own eyes. Ven responds with, So that's why you fight? Revenge? And Vanitas simply laughs in response, telling him it's incredible how he still doesn't understand, which prompts him to cut the chatter and fight. They're not going to continue to fight in the dive to the heart. So this is the final battle of Ventus' story, and also goes all out gameplay-wise. At this point, Terra's battle with Xehanort should have already ended. Xehanort kneels in defeat as usual, admitting that the true reason he wished to recruit Terra was so that someone would inherit his will in any case he couldn't live to see his goals come to fruition. But he states that even if that failed, he had one more failsafe to ensure his continuation. That's when Xehanort releases his heart and possesses Terra in much the same way. In doing so, Terra Xehanort is born, and at the same time, a tiny fragment of Terra's heart was left behind in the process and takes refuge in Terra's armor, thus also creating the Lingering Will. However, I don't think the Lingering Will should materialize right away, so the pieces of armor should just lay there for now. Instead, Terra Nort is actually able to proceed to where Ventus and Venetus are. Once the battle between Ven and Venetus ends, it's increasingly clear that the two are evenly matched. Venetus stares down Ven with increasing hatred, demanding that Ven tell him what he fights for. Ven says he fights to protect his friends, which Venetus writes off as an excuse to fight only for himself. He continues that what he himself fights for is the liberation of the darkness from their oppression and to restore Kingdom Hearts. Ventus interjects that if what he says is true, then he should let them help, explaining that all their life he only wanted to do what he thought was right. Venetus yells that he doesn't need his sympathy and that it's too late to beg for forgiveness. As Venetus charges into attack and they clash their keyblades once more, there's a massive dome of energy that explodes as a result. The two push their Kingdom Keys forward into each other as they begin to merge. After wiping the floor with Brig, Isa, and Lee, Aqua and Mickey are blinded by the flash of light in the distance. Mickey tells Aqua to go on ahead as he holds off the disciples, so that's what she does. As the dome subsides, Ventus and Venetus are both seen holding the Key of Hearts between them. Shocked by its presence, they both stare in awe. However, Venetus violently shakes Ventus off of it, launching him back. Venetus' body begins to radiate with power as he holds it in both hands, mesmerized by its glory. Venetus points the key upwards, proclaiming that with the Key of Hearts, he will save his people and Kingdom Hearts. A beam shoots out of the key and fires high in the sky, which causes a massive keyhole to open, and out comes a rush of darkness. Behind that darkness, Kingdom Hearts slowly begins to appear. However, out of nowhere, Venetus' body seizes up, having been struck from behind by surprise. The Key of Hearts falls as Venetus' limp body tumbles with it. Ven is startled to his feet, shouting Venetus' name. He witnesses Venetus' heart rise from his body and hover in Terra Nort's hand. Ventus is shocked to see what looks like Terra before him, calling out Terra's name. Terra Nort smirks, quickly firing another spell at Ven, hitting him and extracting his heart as well. Aqua is a moment too late as she witnesses Ven's body collapse as his heart flies towards Terranort. Aqua is in pure shock as Terranort walks forward to grab the Key of Hearts, which is hovering out in the open. Out of nowhere, Terranort is forced to dodge an oncoming attack from none other than the Lingering Will, losing grasp of the two extracted hearts. As Terranort yells to the Lingering Will in frustration, Aqua notices the Key of Hearts begin to dematerialize and Kingdom Hearts slowly retreating back into the keyhole. Seeing an opportunity, she rushes towards the Key of Hearts. In a dramatic sequence, Terranort desperately tries to get there first but is blocked by the Lingering Will. She swings her Keyblade at the weakened Key of Hearts, slicing right through it, which causes an absolute cataclysmic burst of energy as the Key of Hearts split into two halves, only to completely shatter a moment later. Terranort shouts in pure vexation with the Lingering Will knocking him back. The eruption of energy forces everyone to immediately leave the area. Mickey flies away with his shard, Brig, Isa, and Lee teleport away, and Aqua scoops up Ven's body, calling out to the Lingering Will to leave with her, assuming it's still Terra, but it simply kneels down only to be absorbed by the blast. Aqua is in tears as she's forced to turn around and fly away, the world crumbling behind her. 
Aqua flies with Ven's body to the Land of Departure to see that it's on the edge of the Dark Realm due to the open keyhole. As the Master's Defender Keyblade lies in the forecourt, she recalls the procedure they were taught just after being given the Mark of Mastery, that if something happens to Ericus and the Land of Departure is on the brink of collapse, to use the Master's Defender Keyblade to seal away the world to oblivion, a failsafe put in place by their ancestors to preserve the world. She places Ven on the throne, telling him she'll be back with Terra to wake him up. She then uses the Keyblade to seal the world away, transforming it into Castle Oblivion. Now in order to tie everything together, I have to change the circumstances of the final scenario. After all, I still want Aqua to end up in the Realm of Darkness, and if the only way to get there is through open keyholes or through a dark corridor, how would Aqua plummet to the Dark Realm from Radiant Garden if Terranort cannot make either of those things occur? Kinda wrote myself into a corner on that one, but I think I can reasonably solve it. Instead of her traveling to Radiant Garden, as soon as she walks out of Castle Oblivion, Terranort is standing outside, having wandered back to what was formerly the Land of Departure. She sees Terranort Terranort struggling to compose himself as Terra's heart is fighting back against Xehanort's possession. Terra briefly surfaces, yelling to get out of his heart, only to be suppressed by Xehanort, who is able to seize full control. Terranort is livid after his plan was foiled by Aqua and the Lingering Will, blaming her for ruining everything and how she has no idea the damage she has caused. Aqua demands he gives Terra's heart back, Terranort lashes out, and you have a two-phase battle outside of Castle Oblivion. One with just Terranort wielding no name, and then a final battle where Terranort summons his Guardian, which is still just Terra's soul or whatever. After the huge clash of dark versus light, Aqua finds herself right on the edge of the corridor of darkness that appeared from the open keyhole. Terranort is able to regain his stance as the Heartless start to surround Aqua. Terranort smirks, telling her not to worry because she'll know what it feels like to be lost to darkness, and then maybe she'll see the truth. As Terranort raises his keyblade to the sky, Aqua catches a glimpse of Terra within him, reaching out to her in helplessness. Aqua calls Terra's name and runs towards Terranort, but he's able to hit her with a gust of dark wind, pushing her back into the dark corridor and into the realm of darkness, where her view of the other side slowly diminishes as she apologizes for failing to protect her friends. The scene where Sora and Riku are on the beach can remain the same. Sora later finds himself dreaming in his dive to the heart where he sees Ven's heart arrive. Ven tells Sora that his heart's been weakened and he needs someone strong to take refuge in. Sora welcomes him and that's that. Ven's heart is now in Sora. Sora assumes it was only a dream and goes about his life. Meanwhile, Terranort finds himself in Radiant Garden, unconscious, where Gnosis discovers him and takes him in. Upon asking his name, Terranort essentially makes something up on the spot and says, Ansem. I don't really have a good origin for this name, so bug it. And of course, Aqua finds herself wandering helplessly in the Realm of Darkness, but I actually don't think this section should be playable here, but rather is somewhat reworked into 0.2, which I will discuss later. Now let's talk about Blank Points. This is hands down one of the best cutscenes in the series, so I don't want to ruin it too much, but there's going to be some differences. The scene where Terra and Xehanort stare each other down is going to have pretty different dialogue. In the original, it seems like this scene probably takes place in the future, but I'm going to change that. Instead, it takes place pretty much right after Terranort is taken in by Gnosis. Xehanort remarks that it's a miracle Terra's heart has stuck around, to which Terra boasts that he'll never let Xehanort take full control of his heart. Xehanort looks with determination, saying his plans aren't for yet as he has other avenues in mind. This really only refers to him splitting his heart into Ansem and Xemnas. Terra at this point knows that Xehanort isn't wrong in his quest for balance, but believes that his methods are unjust and he's the wrong person for the task, presuming that the Key of Hearts would never answer to him. Xehanort ponders if not him, then who? Terra says they'll have to wait and see. The scene with Brig and Terranort can remain the same, but I think instead of Gnosis walking with Ienzo, he should instead be walking with Kairi. Then of course there's the scene with Gnosis and Aqua at the dark margin. This scene can still occur, but there will be some interesting changes. For starters, yes, it still takes place 11 years in the future after the events of Kingdom Hearts 2. Gnosis survived the blast of pure energy and ended up deeper in the Realm of Darkness, where he now finds himself on these shores, staring out into the horizon. He is approached by Aqua, who is now 11 years older. Visually, you should be able to tell Aqua has aged by giving her much longer hair. Of course, still in her same outfit. I don't think that time should work any differently in the Dark Realm anymore, so she aged like normal. Her and Gnosis introduce themselves and discuss how it's clear to anyone who's stuck wandering the Dark Realm that the darkness is not what it once seemed. It isn't some malicious enemy of the light, but its equal counterpart, and it's the responsibility of everyone to uphold the balance at all costs. Aqua reminisces how if 
only her and her friends knew back then that Kingdom Hearts was struggling to such a degree, she knows they would have done something, saying how she would give anything to be with her friends again. Aqua reminds Gnosis of Sora, and he tells the tale of a boy who has touched the lives of countless and that the worlds were threatened to total destruction more than once by hearts with selfish intentions. But the boy arrived Kingdom Key in hand to stop them. Aqua wonders if it's Ven or Terra he's referring to, but Gnosis replies that it's neither. He continues that the boy has been forced to learn many lessons that Gnosis himself could not see at the time, which gives Gnosis hope that he will discover the truth and turn his ambitions towards saving Kingdom Hearts. Gnosis says that the boy's friends are his most valuable asset, giving him the strength he needs, and that even Gnosis' own daughter can't help but be inspired by him. Gnosis acknowledges that he made many mistakes in his quest for revenge, ruining many people's lives, and that all he can do now is wait for his new beginning, and that so many others wait for their birth by sleep. Aqua asks for the boy's name, and then, you know the rest. Sora. 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 The final scene on Destiny Islands has one key change. Because the journey going forward is a collaborative effort and not just something Sora has to deal with, this scene should reflect that. Riku approaches Sora asking if he's made up his mind. Sora says to Riku that they really need them and that he is who he is because of them. That's when Kairi approaches and asks if he's ready. Sora says yes, asking her the same question. Kairi nods her head and says, let's go. Holy fuck, we can finally discuss gameplay. I don't have as many specific gameplay changes here because I'm not as familiar with it as other KH games, but the biggest problem with Birth by Sleep's gameplay isn't necessarily what you're capable of as a player because there's a ton of really fun variety, but rather the absolutely atrocious enemy design. The stagger and revenge value system desperately needs to return from KH2. It's such a simple yet effective system that is practically necessary to make bosses fair and enjoyable in this style of game. No more enemies randomly breaking through attacks and no more hit sponges. That's not to mention how many bosses are designed to to teleport around and throw endless amounts of random shit at you with no way of reacting. Bosses and super bosses need clear, consistent openings and ways to reasonably react to certain attacks, and overall be punishable and not just spam you with bullshit. And I think that about covers it. That was my incredibly long rewrite of Birth by Sleep. What time are we at? Oh, fuck.